Sorry, who's better at this on? Yeah, Mike's on. Can you guys hear me okay? Check, check. I'm going to tell you what love is. Love is coming to speak on Cyber Monday when I really should be online shopping right now. <laughs> and for any of you that happen to also have been in Corbin's class a couple months ago when I came and speak, you get like 30 minutes of online shopping while I catch you up to the Q&A part. So I'm excited to be here. I want to give you guys a little bit of my background just to let you know who I am. I grew up in a family of 10 kids, lived all over the country, Oregon, Washington, Michigan, Virginia, Tennessee, Texas, California, and then Utah. My goal in life was to come out to BYU, marry that guy, and have a bunch of kids like my mom had. And I started down that path. I came out to BYU when I was 17 years old and started out in the business program at BYU. And my life didn't exactly go like the little fairy tale that I thought it would. I ended up getting married very quickly, had two little kids, had to drop out of college to put my husband at the time through, and became a divorced single mom with two kids who had no degree and no idea how she was going to feed her family. So my story did not exactly go where I thought it was going to go. Now to go from being that girl to someone who could start and sell a healthcare technology company for $377 million, I actually learned a lot along the way. Now one of the first messages I want you guys to know is wherever you're sitting at today, if you're questioning in your head, am I enough? You could not have been less than I was back then <laughs> and in a worse spot with less education to draw on. I mean, I literally came out to BYU to date. I'm not going to lie to you. Like, I had nothing to do with getting an education at the time, although I did a lot, learn a lot of valuable things during the time that I was here. Um, the very first thing that I had to learn how to do is how to overcome fear, which I think is probably one of the things that stops most adults as well as most young people today is fear. We all have these fears, right? And the first thing I had to overcome was a fear of what other people thought. I obviously didn't fit the mold. I'm a member of the church. I grew up always a member of the church and chose to be a member of church when I was old enough to figure it out for myself as well. And one of the things that I had to do is quit worrying about what other people thought because we get our stereotype in our head of the mold we should fit into, right? And when we don't fit in that mold, we're really hard on ourselves. And I learned that I could be this awesome person doing everything right and people might not like you. People might say bad things about you. People might not think you're very smart or very good or whatever it is. You can't control what other people think. That's the reality. But the only person you can control what they think is Heavenly Father. And when I figured that out at a young age, that changed everything for me. Because I was like, I, could, I can control what he thinks, right? And I know at the end of the day when I get down on my knees what he thinks. And that was something that helped me to have a lot more confidence in myself, okay? The other thing I learned is that there's two ways we picture ourselves. So there's a way we see ourselves, you know, that insecure kind of, I'm not good enough, I'm not pretty enough, whatever it is, right? We all have those like things we knock on ourselves for. And that's kind of the one way we see ourselves. And then there's this picture of this ideal self that we want to be. And what I learned is there's this trick, we've all heard fake it till you make it. Well, it's really real in a lot of ways. Like I learned that I could actually picture my hero and who I wanted to be, which was Wonder Woman. That's the OG for you that are too young to know the difference. <laughs> and she's still my hero. Got to meet her, it was very cool. And Chris Pine at the premiere of Wonder Woman, which was also very cool. Love my husband, but it's Chris Pine. Come on, you got to be excited about that. <laughs> so I realized that when I was scared of feeling insecure, I could literally close my eyes and be like, okay, you're Wonder Woman. Go in that room, be Wonder Woman, do what you got to do. Then you can come out and be insecure Amy again. And that actually really works. It really does. Like having that courage to say, here's a hero of mine. I'm going to pretend I'm that person. It gives you this confidence to kind of get through those hard things. And then guess what? Once you've done something that scared you, it's a lot less scary the next time around. So you just have to get through that very first time with each thing, and you'll have a lot more confidence and courage. I luckily had an amazing family to draw on. One of my grandparents, that's him up there, he was one of my heroes. He's passed away now. But one time when I was talking with him and asking him for some advice on what I should do, he shared a story with me. And I usually don't get into the story because I speak at a lot of universities that aren't religious universities. But for here, it's cool that I get to share the actual story. He was praying back as a young man, trying to figure out what to do with his family. And he said he'd been praying for days and days, you know, Holy Father, what should I do? What, should I, what direction should I go? And he said, finally, after days of this, he had a voice come in his head that said, get up, do something, do anything, just make a start. And he said it really kind of kicked him in the behind to go, you know, here I am praying for Heavenly Father to solve my problem. And what have I done on my own to try to solve it? And it really helped me to recognize that you don't have to wait till you have it all figured out. You just have to be moving because, see, God can't drive a parked car. But if you're driving, he can kind of help you with the guide rails, right, and keep you where you need to go. But you got to be moving. And it's okay if you start in one direction and it goes another way. My dad set out in college to be a dentist. My dad went into the FBI. If you met my dad, 
the thought of him being a dentist would be hilarious because <laughs> the man fits the FBI mold, if you know what I'm talking about. And so, like, he, but he had started in a direction and then life took him somewhere else. So Heavenly Father will get you where you need to go if you just start down the path in a good direction. Now, if you asked yourself the question, what would I do if I wasn't afraid? Does that, how many of that, if you ask this question, how many of you by raise of hands, does it change the course you're currently on? If you could do anything and not be afraid of failing, would you be doing something different, right? So think about that. Ask yourself that question. What would I do if I wasn't afraid to fail? Because the answer to that is probably the right question, answer for you guys. I sat down at a young age and made a goal poster. It was about 23, okay? I sat down and made this poster. Um, at the time, I thought goal posters were kind of hokey. I'd never really made one growing up. I was like, you know, what's a poster gonna do? But I was desperate, <laughs> and I thought, well, what's it gonna hurt, right? So I sat down and I made a poster, and I put things on that poster, like I wanted to win, I was like, I'm gonna be an entrepreneur, because back then they didn't, by the way, they didn't have a major in entrepreneurship, like that was what you did if you had like no clue what you were gonna do. So you just picked that, it sounded good, but I decided I'll be an entrepreneur, but I'm gonna do that, I wanna be a really good entrepreneur, and I want an Entrepreneur of the Year Award, because that's like the big deal, right? And I wanna be on the cover of magazines, and I wanna meet Bill Gates, because Microsoft was brand new with their Windows product. And all these different things on my gold poster. And I hung it on the wall and I didn't think about it again for a lot of, about seven, eight years. I'm going to come back to that and tell you what happened in my life with that gold poster. Now, when I decided I was going to be an entrepreneur, now I had to find an opportunity. And how many of you guys want to be an entrepreneur but don't know an opportunity to go after? Okay. So I'll give you some tips on how you can find opportunities. Number one is pay attention. When people are complaining about a topic and they're complaining a lot, that is an opportunity because there's a way to solve that, right? In my case, I was working in medical offices. I'd been working in that through high school. I'd graduated like at a young age, come out to BYU and was working at a medical office out here. And so I knew that space, right? And in medical offices, I have the gift of ADD, attention deficit disorder. I take medication for it. I am not ashamed. Um, and none of you should be if you ever need medication for something. It's just like you break an arm, you get it fixed. You have some chemical in your brain missing, you get it fixed. It's no big deal. So I had ADD, it was a gift, right? We're all given our weaknesses or whatever, strengths for a reason. So I got really bored working in medical offices because I had to get up and go pull charts and like scam people, like make photocopies of their insurance card and then refile the chart. And I was like, this is so dumb, Windows is new, why can't we just scan insurance cards, right? It was a boring thing, I knew it affected everyone in offices everywhere. And that's kind of what became the impetus for me starting my very first company was this idea that, you know, there's this new technology that's come out there's a different way to do it than everyone else was doing it. Because back then they were using like DOS and Unix, which you probably don't know what that is, but it was a black screen with little white characters and that's all you got. Um, and so for me, I think that's how you find opportunities is pay attention to the discontent. Pay attention to how many people complain about it. The more the better, right? That means you have a bigger market size. And market size does matter. If you focus on an area that's so niche that you have to sell everybody in that area to make money, it's a really hard business for an investor to get involved in. So if you pick something where there's a ton of people and you only have to sell a little sliver of the people, that's an easier thing for investors to get behind, okay? Also remember, the second mouse gets the cheese. You don't have to have this totally original idea. Go and look at what's being done by companies that are solving a problem today. Look at all of them and write down, here's what's good about them, here's what's bad, and figure out if there's a way to start a company that takes all the good and leaves out all the bad, right? Because that works too, and sometimes that's a lot easier because it's a proven market space. Friend. The next thing was overcoming a fear of a dumb idea. Okay, a lot of us have these ideas and we're like, oh my gosh, it can't be that great of an idea because if it was, someone would have done it already, right? There's people smarter than me, but let's think of a few of the things that might have been seen as a dumb idea, right? The Slanket, Snuggy, I don't know, there's a billion different brands. Um, this was started by a kid who got cold playing video games in college, so his mom took a sleeve bag and cut out holes in the arms, and then his arms got cold, so she put sleeves on it for him, because like, she's probably like me, where I do all kinds of dumb stuff for my kids. <laughs> but that has made millions and millions of dollars, right? Um, another one would be doggles, goggles for your dog, right? Sold all over the country right now. Dumb idea, well, it's making money, so is it dumb? Pillow pets, I know you people have them. <laughs> Wash them, that's my daughter, by the way. She has a pillow pet, don't know the last time it got washed. <laughs> So wash your pillow pets. But they're selling hundreds of millions of dollars a year. So is it a dumb idea if it makes money? Whereas someone could have this brilliant, genius concept, and guess what, if no one buys it, is it a good business idea? Right, probably not. So think about that. One of my favorite scriptures that's been something that's gotten me through so much in life is this one. It's 2 Timothy 1.7. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Every time I get afraid, I look at that scripture. It's sitting on my mirror at home. Like, I keep it everywhere to remind myself that. Because it is easy to get afraid. 
it's easy to think we're not enough. And I think that's probably Satan's biggest hope is that we'll believe we're not enough, right? Because then he wins and we lose. So the other thing is do something with what you guys have. If you're sitting there going, I don't have the money to start something, I don't have the resources, look, look at what you do know. For me, I knew healthcare, and I was really good at looking at software and saying, oh, if it only did this, it would be better. Now, I didn't know I was designing software at the time. I was just drawing on a piece of graph paper. If a software could look like this and have the buttons here and this user interface to look like this, that would be awesome. Ultimately, I ended up raising the money and creating my own software and developing one of the first ones for web-based internet software for medical offices. So that's what kind of started me into that entrepreneurial path, but it came from looking at what have I done so far and what have I learned from that, right? There's a reason I think that Heavenly Father puts us through certain experiences and he's leading us towards something. What are you, what are you good at? What resources do you have? Look, you guys might sit here, you have, no, you have contacts, there's people you know. And guess what? Your parents and their friends, that's a resource for you. Okay, if you don't use that, that's just shame on you because <laughs> Heavenly Father put you in that position for a reason. Leverage those resources. You have laptops. You've got a camera. You, how many of you guys do social media? Every one of you. How many of you have ever gotten one like? Okay, you guys know how to market. Okay, you don't realize that you're really good marketers. And that is a huge resource that you bring to the table already. You're here at BYU and there's a million things on campus that you can go to and resources you can use for free while you're here. Milk it as a student as much as you can because once you graduate, you're, you can't use these resources. <laughs> so seriously, take advantage. Go to the events. Go to hear the different speakers that come. When there's a competition, enter it. Who cares if you lose? The point is, enter it just for the experiences you're going to have and take advantage of all of that. When you ask yourself what you're passionate about, this is where I think people get a little sideways, right? I wasn't passionate about healthcare. I'm not going to lie to you. I just had had experience in healthcare. I was passionate about my family and shoes. Love shoes. So, <laughs> um, but there's, there's more than one way to fulfill your passion. You see, I knew healthcare and I was able to make a living off that, which then fulfilled the passion of taking care of my family and afforded me the opportunity to buy a whole lot of shoes. Okay, so you can actually take your experiences and work as hard no matter whether you love it or not. And sometimes if you do your passion, if I would have done a business around shoes, I probably would have lost my love of shoes, quite frankly, because it becomes a job, not a love. So if you're thinking, oh, I have to do something this, you'll be passionate about whatever you put your heart and soul into. That's just the truth. And you can make a difference in any field. I firmly believe that. Okay, so I started my first company back in 1996 with $23,000 in seed capital that I raised from my dad and my uncle, hardest money I ever raised, and I bootstrapped that company. Now, bootstrapping, I'm sure you guys have been learning about that already, is where you start, basically, you don't go and raise a bunch of money, you, you grow as you sell a product. So I would sell something and then I would grow, and then I'd sell something and I'd grow. Now, what I love about bootstrapping a business is you learn so many awesome discipline, like discipline that you would not learn otherwise. I get really freaked out today at how people go and raise a ton of money really early, because guess what? You're gonna raise money and you're gonna spend it. And you didn't have to spend that money and you didn't need to raise that much. I kinda, it's a shoe analogy, right? When I was younger and I had my pay less shoes, they were enough. The men in the room do not understand this analogy at all. The women are tracking with me. So <laughs> I, I bought those shoes, my first, you know, pay less shoes, they were cheap shoes, I was fine with those. Until I got my first pair of Christian Louboutins, right? That's the red bottom for the men that don't understand <laughs> the shoe, okay? Once I had that Christian Louboutin, now had to have that shoe, right? That was no longer a want. That was like a need. I had to have it. And then that need grew into like an obsession with lots of nice shoes. So the problem is your needs will expand with the money you raise. If you go and raise a ton of money, you're going to think you need a ton of money, and it creates a different, like I could literally have named my talk, everything I need to know to be successful, I learned in primary. Because it's really true. The principles that help you be successful in the gospel are the exact same principles that will make you successful in business. Okay, don't live above your means. Be wise with the, the stewardship of the money that you do have. Don't spend more than you need to. And don't put yourself in a position where you start to think your value is based on the valuation you raised money at. Right? I don't care. You could raise whatever you wanted at a billion dollar valuation until you sell that company and have a portion of it left. You're not really worth anything as a business. Right? It's not about how much you raise. And, and the hype around that, I think, has gotten kind of crazy out of control in Utah. Like, I raised as little as possible because every time you raise, you're going to dilute yourself and your employees and your shareholders. I only raised what was necessary, and I didn't raise until I had to. I wanted to become responsible first because the first time I took a dime from somebody else, I now had a fiduciary obligation and a moral one 
to return that to my investors. And I took that just as seriously as any kind of church obligation I've ever had. And it made me a lot more responsible with the way I ran my company. I ran it to be profitable. I didn't go buy fancy offices when I didn't have the cash to pay for them, just like I wouldn't go buy a fancy home when I didn't have the cash to pay for that, right? So think of all those principles that you learn in the gospel and apply them to your business. The other thing is when you decide to start a company, if what you're offering is good, if it is a good business idea, people will pay for it. And that's a lot different when your friends say, oh, yeah, that's a great idea. Okay, would you, would you sign up and pay for it? And then their answer changes a lot of times, right? So you, if your business is good and the concept is good, you'll be able to find paying customers and you won't have to go raise a bunch. Before I ever sold a product to a client, before we developed software, I would literally do a mock-up wireframe, take it to meet with the customer and say, if I can have this developed by this date, would you sign a contract to pay for this? And I would get a commitment before I started development. So think how much money I saved doing it that way, right? I didn't make as many mistakes along the way. The other thing is, if you want to go raise capital, you, you're not going to gain credibility with chaos. You've got to be organized. That means you have your ducks in a row, your documents are right. You know what contracts you've signed. You know what customer contracts you have. Like, make sure that you are super organized. We kept everything really organized in our company. Every contract was scanned in. Like, people that are, when they, when they go to sell a company and they ask you for your data room, they call it the data room, and that's where they'll ask you for all the documents with your whole company. Every contract you've ever done, every, everything you've ever, financial statement you have, we kept it super, super organized. And when they asked to, when they made an offer to buy our company, we were able to upload a data room to them in less than 24 hours. Normally that would have taken most company months to pull together. Think what that said about our credibility to the buyer. And it helped us negotiate a much higher exit. Okay, so keep your stuff organized and, and don't discount the importance of starting it when you're starting out because that will help you so much as you grow. If you wait till you're big, it's so hard to go back. How you communicate with people, investors, customers, everybody, it really matters. So there's a kind of fun experience. How, is there any married men in the room? Okay, so when your wife comes up to you and says, hey, can we talk? See that dark, you just went to a dark place right there. Yes, you did, my friend. Or someone else Mary says, can we go to, we need to go, I need you to go to Costco with me. It's like, oh my gosh, right? It's the only thing worse is quilted bear or something. <laughs> but they did this experiment where they brought a bunch of men and women in a room and they said, stay here and then we're gonna take you to the next room. And when they took them to the next room, they said, we wanna know two things. How, tell us what you know about the people around you and how many exits were in the room and where were they located? As you can imagine, the women knew everything about the people around them, had no idea on the exits. The men knew nothing about the people around them, knew exactly where the exits were located and how many of them there were. And they did a whole bunch of these little experiments and what they kind of deduced from these experiments is before men can engage in a conversation, they have to know three things. One, is it gonna be painful? Two, how long is it gonna take? And three, when you're done talking to me, what are you gonna want? What's my exit, right? If you can tell them those three things up front, so instead of your wife saying, can we talk? If she says, hey, I need to talk to you for two minutes when we're done, go play Fortnite or watch a football game. I don't care, we're good, that's all I need. Are you down to talk? Yeah. And the Costco thing, like we're gonna go to Costco, we're gonna pick up this one thing when we're done, you can go out with your buddies. Totally changes their attitude, by the way, for the women in the room. You're gonna, you're gonna use this, trust me, it works so well. <laughs> Save relationships, not just in business. But what they come to learn in business is that men and the women are the same on this front in business. If you call, if I get a voicemail at my office and they say, hey Amy, um, this is Bob, can you call me back? I'm like, oh, I go to that dark place you did, right? It's like this, I don't know what my exit is. If someone calls, so I'm gonna avoid calling back. But if somebody calls and says, hi Amy, this is so-and-so, I have one quick question, that's all I need from you. If you can give me a quick call back, I'm like, dude, I'm totally down, I'll call you back. See the difference? So make sure you're communicating where you let people know those three things right up front and you'll get a much better response. The other thing is, you guys, your number one asset you have today, this is not just a, from a church perspective, and a life perspective and a business perspective. Your number one most valuable asset that you have in your possession is your integrity. It is a financially valuable thing beyond anything you can imagine. And I, like, I wish everybody could understand that at a very young age because it's so hard to build a reputation of integrity and so quick to lose it, okay? Don't do anything to put that at risk, including pretending that you know it all. So often when people come to raise money, they're like, oh yeah, this, and I know this, and I know this, and we instantly as in investors go, I don't trust you, right? Because I, I know that you're not the only one that does this business, because I've met with 10 of your competitors in the last month. And I know it's not impossible for anyone to catch up to you because we've invested in companies that have already surpassed this. You see what I'm saying? So I like to call it my little Bentley analogy. I got remarried to a really good guy who bought me a Bentley for my birthday, so. 
<laughs> if my kids as teenagers have come up and said, hey, mom, can we drive the Bentley? And hey, don't worry about it. I got this. I, you know, it's it's going to be all fine. Do you think I'm going to trust them with a car? No, no. But if my kid came up and said, hey, mom, I want to use your Bentley. Now, here's the deal. I know it's a really expensive car. I know that I've got to be incredibly careful with that car. I also know that it's not just about if I'm careful, but there's other people on the road, and I have to like watch out for them as well. How do you think my trust level in them changes? Good enough to give them the Range Rover, probably not the Bentley, but, <laughs> but the point is, do you see the difference, right? Because now they're acknowledging, they're acknowledging they understand the risks. And that actually gives them more credibility. So when you go in to pitch your company to somebody, don't go in there and be like, oh, we're the only one that we're going to be a billion dollar company. No, you're not. You guys, it's so much harder than that. But go in and say, you know what, yeah, I can't patent this idea I have. It's not patentable, but, and I realize it's a marketing play, so I'm going to have to work really hard. Here's the ways I think I can counteract that, but here's the things I know I have to be aware of as well. In your mind, you're thinking, oh, that makes, makes me seem less credible. No, it doesn't. It makes you so much more credible, okay? Don't be a know-it-all. Plus, to be honest with you, how many of you guys have friends that are know-it-alls? When's the last time you ever wanted to help them with anything? Why? Because they already know everything, right? So think about it. But if you have a friend who's like, man, I could really use your advice on this. Are you excited to help them? Yeah. Investors are the same way. They don't want to just give money. They want to give some of the knowledge they've learned over everything they've done. And if you already know it all, guess what? You can go get a check anywhere. Do you see the difference? It's okay not to know it all. It doesn't mean you're not smart enough. It doesn't mean you're not good enough. The smartest people are the ones who admit they don't know it all. And they're open to learning. Right? It goes back to that whole thing about everything I need to know I learned in primary. If we knew it all in the gospel, we'd have no reason to go to church every Sunday and read our scriptures and all those things. We all have a lot to learn. Okay, a couple of four quick secrets that we had that helped our company be successful. And I'm going to fly through some of these because I really want to leave extra time for Q&A. You guys, you can operate within your means. It doesn't have to cost a lot of money. And the thing is, when you have no money, you get super creative. So with MediConnect, one of the things that we learned is you can do a lot with your brand. Okay? We had to hire people to worry about healthcare records. We did a lot of healthcare record analytics where we were doing big analysis for law firms, life insurance companies, health insurance companies, and we couldn't let people bring their cell phones to work or get on the internet, which was like super hard to want to hire people because who wants a job where you can't even check your social media at all, right? Because we had to protect the healthcare data we had. So we had to come up with some creative things. We didn't spend a lot of money for that. We were like, okay, let's make it cool to be secure because if you work for the CIA, that's pretty cool, and you can't take your phone to work there or get on the internet there. So we decided to just use branding, and it's a really powerful tool, and we branded the whole company where we changed titles. So instead of the finance department, it was the Treasury Enforcement Agency, right? It just sounds way cooler. And we did these spy kind of logos around the office. We redid our company logos to have that spy look and feel. We did like screensavers on everybody's desktops. These were all like really cheap little things we did. We, if you killed it on the job, you got your star on the wall, right? <laughs> Didn't cost a lot of money, but it kind of went through with this branding. You can really tie it in all over the company. And so we even gave out shirts to our employees that said MCG, which was really fun because it made them seem, feel cool, like FBI or something walking around. People stopping them at TSA being like, dear, which department you work for? <laughs> so it was just a little simple thing that was really inexpensive, but it, you can do some creative things like that that help. The other thing is like when we had to go and recruit people, we decided we weren't going to recruit anymore for skills because I could teach you a skill, but I couldn't teach you a value. So we decided we're going to hire people for their values and then we'll train them on the skills because we learned through painful mistakes that that was much easier to do. But we had to now get people to apply that would normally not have applied. We didn't go and hire a big recruiting firm and pay a bunch of money. We came up with a simple idea and said, look, we're going to put it out there that if you have integrity and you can respect others and you're open to feedback and you go the extra mile and things like that, then we want you to apply. So to get the message out, we decided to, ahead of the movie theaters, because we all go to the movies in Utah, we had our employees, we said, film your dumbest talent and send it in. Okay, so I'm going to show you some of the commercials we did. And these were done so inexpensive, incredibly successful. There's no sound. It doesn't sound normally, but it's okay. It doesn't need it. These are actual employees filmed on their own little cell phone. Okay, people in the theater watching that, like, oh my gosh, if that guy could get a job at MediConnect, I could probably get one too. Here's another one. You see, it doesn't have to take a ton of money. These were crazy. We had a whole bunch of these, right? And we did them with such cheap production value, it was almost laughable. People didn't care. People in the theater were looking at it going, man, if that guy can get a job, so can I. We would go to companies that had good values that we thought they had fastened in their bathrooms, put signs that said, if you're reading this right now, you're clearly a good multitasker. And it just so happens we're in the market to hire a multitasker, so give us a call. 
So like we found creative ways, you know, when we would repurpose things. We bought one company that had a big RV and we rewrapped it and used it as a mobile hiring center. We'd drive out to the parking lot of companies with good values they espoused and like hand out now hiring cards and people dressed like men in black. Um, <laughs> we use some fun, create. you gotta get creative, right? You gotta be able to call attention to what you're doing in creative ways. We've all seen the YouTube videos that go viral and these companies get crazy popular just from that simple funny video. Um, we would stand out in our cul-de-sac with little signs that said, shame on you for not applying at MetaConnect. It was a really great way to hire people in the, in the business park we were in. Um, we also learned that the best way to find the people with values is to go where they were. So we had little cards made up for all employees that said, we're hiring when you call, tell them so-and-so says you're awesome. And we told employees, if you see someone at the drive-through at Wendy's and they're super friendly and happy and nice to you, give them a now hiring card. Because if they can be happy in that job, they can be happy in any job, so we're gonna hire them, right? And by the way, Jimmy John's people are awesome. Love Jimmy John's employees. <laughs> best customer service ever, right? Same with Nordstrom's. I'm just saying, we learned who had really good quality people there. So that also should tell you, though, the way that we were hiring people, again, we could teach them healthcare and we could teach them technology, but we couldn't teach them values. And they never knew we were watching them. They had no idea. You never know, as you're living your life, who's watching you and paying attention to the values that you're showing that you have. So always be mindful of that. Okay, our cheapest marketing ideas came from when my daughter here was in, and her and Bridger, who's your TA, were in high school together at Alta High. $4.99 hot and ready Little Caesars pizza, those kids in high school would give me all my marketing ideas. I never had to hire a firm ever because I got free marketing ideas, well, $4.99. <laughs> those kids would come and they were brilliant marketers. You guys are actually kind of like old now, so you have to go to the younger high school, junior high, because they totally know what's cool and they will help you come up with free branding and marketing ideas. Okay, our number one rule, we wrote it on my office wall, it said do what's right. First, it just started with that top line. And we had that right on my office wall, so every meeting we had, we were looking at that. And then we went in and added, let the consequence follow. And the reason why is we started to find that as you're doing things in business, it is really easy to start to play mind games with yourself and, and kind of skew what's right and wrong. Let me give you an example. You're bidding on a deal, and you know your competitor's gonna overstate their RFP. So you're like, oh, I have to overstate mine too or I won't win the deal. And I can't let them win the deal because we know they're dishonest people. So we're gonna like overstate ours and, and kind of, what do they call it, puffing or whatever. Like we're gonna puff who we are and make it sound better so we can compete. No, that you can't, listen, it's not worth it. It's never worth it because it will forever affect your reputation. So we decided, we're gonna decide up front, we're gonna always do the right thing. Knowing that at times doing the right thing means you might not win that deal. And you have to be okay with that. That's why we put on let the consequence follow. It was our way of saying, you know what, we're gonna do the right thing and yeah, at times it's gonna kinda suck because we're gonna lose the deal <laughs> and that's not fun. But we're, we'd rather have our integrity because success is gonna come and go but our integrity it's forever. And that helped take the decision off the table in so many instances and it also helped us call each other out when we were starting to like, because look, we all do it, we justify you know, the right result, wrong way to get there because you think that's the only way there. Just don't let yourself get sucked into that. It's never worth it, ever. And when you do make a mistake, because you're gonna make a million of them, just own it. Own it, fix it, learn from it, and then put safeguards in place so you don't make the same mistake again. Our rule at our company is you can make any mistake once, and we'd all have your back. You make the same one twice, that's it. Except for an integrity, you couldn't even make one of those once. Any area but integrity, you can make. Because guess what, that's how we learn. You guys are gonna make a million mistakes. It is not a failure to make mistakes, right? If you make a mistake and you learn from it, you didn't fail. It made you smarter and you're gonna be wiser. Nobody in my position, success-wise, got here without making a gazillion mistakes, okay? Times when it's just so embarrassing, you fall flat on your face and you think that's it, that's the end. And it's mortifying, but guess what? It's not a failure and it's not the end. Not if you learn from it and you get smarter from it. So don't be scared to try things because that's how you're gonna learn. If you look back at your life, you're not gonna remember the things that you did. You're gonna remember the hard lessons you learned by making mistakes. Communication's everything. One of the biggest lessons for me, and was probably one of the most humbling as a leader, is that if I didn't communicate for myself what my values were, someone was gonna do it for me. And the chances are they weren't gonna give the right, the right values. And that was hard, because we grew from like 70 people up to 2,000 people worldwide. And it was really hard because I felt like, oh, I'd hear these things in the company where people say, oh, she thinks this or that. And I'm like, that's not what I think, right? I mean, I believe in this, this, and this, and they should know that. So I actually started writing a daily blog. It was the only way I could communicate with all these people in all these offices. And I started that blog in 2010. And when I started the blog, I told my employees, I'm gonna write this five days a week, I'm never gonna miss a day. 
And I knew I couldn't because if I did, then they wouldn't trust me anymore. And it didn't, wasn't a professional blog that said, I'm your boss, and this is why I'm so smart, and blah, blah, no. It was like, hey, I really screwed up today. I made a mistake. Here's what I learned from it, and I'm really sorry, right? Or, gosh, this is something I've been really worried about, or I'm struggling with this issue, or, you know, it's, it's really hard to put your pants on out of the dryer. It really knocks your self-esteem after Thanksgiving. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, like, really real, right? It was so real and authentic. And what I learned was the more vulnerable I was and the more open I was, the more people rallied to want to help me because guess what? As soon as they knew I wasn't a know-it-all, they wanted to help me be successful. And that was the number one key to my achieving the success was the fact that I was just real. I remember sitting in a Relief Society class once and you know, I was a, at the time I was like still this divorced single mom and I was like kind of quiet in the back of the room because I thought, well, I, they don't fit in. They're talking about sewing and I'm running a tech company and I just don't relate, right? And this lady teaching was like, well, my husband and I were on a cruise ship and I had a gambling issue, so <laughs> I had to like have my husband keep me off the casino floor. And I was like, yeah, I love you right now. Like it was like all of a sudden I'm like, she's like real, right? And it made me like, oh, it made me realize, oh, we got to be real with each other because none of us are perfect and we're all struggling. And if we're just real and let people know what our vulnerabilities are, they will help us. They will. They'll get behind you and help you. So I started that blog and have not, after I sold the company in 2012, they're like, oh, will you keep writing your blog? And I was like, you don't need to read it anymore. I'm not your boss. And they were like, we love learning from you. So I have, I've continued to write that blog every day, five days a week, haven't missed a day since 2010. So it'll be 10 years this August, you guys. And it's my way of putting it out there, what I learned. And the employees could go in and comment back on it. So there was a bi-directional conversation. And we had idea boards where anyone could post an idea and everyone voted on it. And everybody felt part of the company and took ownership of everything we did. Those made a difference. And as we did, those t-shirts I'd given for Christmas, all of a sudden they were like, hey, we want all these other products too. Can you buy us all this other stuff? And I was like, no, because I'm super cheap. And they were like, well, we'll pay for it. And I was like, do you guys want to pay for it? And they're like, yeah, we're so excited about being, like they felt the success of the business with me, right? Because they were such a part of it. And it was so much inclusive of that. The more you allow other people to share in the success, the more bought in they are. So can you imagine how cheap it was from a marketing perspective when they were paying for their own MCG stuff and wearing it all over town? That's a pretty incredible culture to build. The other thing is we learned with customers, make it personal, you guys. We would have everyone log into our site and they'd see this little photo stock person and we realized that's just not personal. And so we would put the account manager's faces in there. And all of a sudden they felt like a connection to who they were dealing with, right? Because so much is done online. And then I was like, man, I love going to Google because every day it's a little bit different and I never know what I'm going to see. So we thought, we got to mix it up. Let's make it fun. So our account managers would put on costumes. And when you logged in, you'd see your account manager wearing a different costume that day. People loved it. They thought it was so much fun, right? Started to make it engaging with the customer. We decided to drop our newsletters that we were doing as a company because no one was reading them anyway. And instead, we sent out a newsletter that said, hey, if you want to get your spouse to watch football during the Super Bowl, tell them about the personal lives of the player. And here's who's dating this Kardashian, and here's who did this. And we gave them little tips, right? It was totally nothing to do with MediConnect Global, which is a healthcare technology company. But they read it, and they thought it was fun. And then they were forwarding it to their friends at different companies that also could have been our customers. And we'd get called and they'd say, I don't even know what you guys do, but you guys are really cool. Can we come and do business with you? Right? Because you're making people feel good and you're making them happy. And you're still going to get the credit as a company, even if it has nothing to do with the product you're selling. Okay? We would be really mindful of remembering people's names and the important events in their life. Like I said, so those church principles of treating people well and treat them like they matter because they do. And you'll get such an incredible result. We would even give out DNA charts to people as gifts for holidays to customers. They loved that stuff, right? At the end of the day, you want to be a Tigger, not an Eeyore, because nobody wants to hang out with a Tigger or with an Eeyore, but everybody wants to hang out with Tigger because he's just like fun, 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 right? And people do business with people they like. I went to go buy a bike with my husband last year because we were going on this bike ride, which I hadn't bought a bike since I was 12, and it had a banana seat with flowers and tassels and a bell. And so I go into the bike shop, right? I know nothing. I'm terrified to go on this bike ride for good reason. Right? Because if you need numbing cream for anything, you shouldn't be doing it. That's my personal opinion. <laughs> so we're at these two different stores, right? And they're same exact bike, exact same bike, more expensive at the second store. But guess what? That salesperson let me know you need numbing cream and what shorts to go buy and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, they were so nice. Even though they didn't sell those products, they just took time with me. And I told my husband, we're going to buy it from this person. And he's like, no, it's like 300 bucks cheaper over here. I was like, no, I like that person. And I want to do business with them. Okay, people do business with people they like. 
remember that. Those are the principles that helped us grow that company to be a huge success and sell for $377 million, which was pretty awesome, frankly. Now, I want to go back to the fear. You guys have got to get over your fear if you're ever going to get to fabulous. Okay, you've got to remember from a spiritual perspective, God doesn't want you to be afraid, and you can't be afraid to fail. And that when things go wrong, because they're going to go wrong, and this is one of my biggest fears for people in your age group today, the number of suicides, just over the holiday alone, I was aware of three different suicides. That, that's unbelievable to me, right? Like, I think back to that 17-year-old girl who got married and dropped out of college and had two kids and had no idea how she was going to take put bread on the table, which, by the way, ladies, part of being a good mom is being able to put bread on the table when you need to. So don't ever feel like you're wrong to pursue your education and to finish your education because it's not. It's the best thing. And for the men in the room, you better encourage these girls to finish. And you encourage them to be able to be self-reliant. And if they get the blessing of being able to stay home full-time, awesome. But they need to be able to take care of their families because you don't know what's going to happen. None of us do, right? So education does matter. So proud my daughter stuck through it, even though she probably wanted to stop a million times. She's graduating in April, hmm? Yeah, in entrepreneurship, by the way. <laughs> it is so important. But if as a girl at that age, when I was like getting out of this abusive situation and I had these kids and I was terrified and I felt like I was such a loser and I didn't even know how to take out my own trash because I'd always had a dad or a husband to do it and I cried all the way to the curb the first time I had to take it out. That is a true story. If I at that moment would have allowed myself to succumb to the thought of this is the end, think of how different things would have been. Okay, she wouldn't have had a mom. All those employees that I employed that had to feed their kids and send them on missions and to school and educations, none of them would have been able to do it through those means. Like the lives that I've been able to impact by sticking with it and sucking it up when things were hard and getting on my knees and put my faith in Heavenly Father that, man, it's not the end. And sometimes the worst moments, we had a deal fall through at the last minute at one point with my first company. We had a deal that fell apart and I'd already hired a bunch of employees and it was a $2 million contract that got pulled at the last minute because someone had done something dishonest with the parent company and they were going to have, the FBI came in and raided their offices. There was nothing I could do. And we sat in a circle as employees and I said, guys, I don't know what to do. And one of the guys goes, well, there's always failure. And we all laughed because we're like, you know what, worst case we fail. We can go get jobs at McDonald's if we have to, right? I can ask if you want fries with that. <laughs> there's still a path forward. So we, if I had stopped though, you guys think what would have happened. Think how different it would have been, right? Think of that 377 million, almost everybody paid tithing on that, by the way. That's a temple or something. I don't know how much they cost, but I'm pretty sure it helped the church. So the point is, don't give up. If that deal hadn't fallen apart, I never would have had the courage to then go develop my own software for the internet, because I was selling a Windows-based software back then. And that failure moment where things fell apart turned out to be the best financial thing that ever happened to me. In that moment, did I know that? No. How many of you guys have been through a bad breakup? Guess what? I went through a bad divorce, ended up with a much hotter, awesome husband now. So it's all good, right? <laughs> this sign, everything will be okay in the end. If it's not okay, it's not the end. Please remember that and don't give up. I'm going to end on the power of the goal poster. And then there's an, 45 minutes of questions upstairs, right? Okay, 30 minutes of questions. That goal poster I made, eight years later, I was in my office moving it, and I realized, holy cow, everything on that poster has happened in my life. I had won Entrepreneur of the Year award. I was on the cover of Inc. Magazine. I would made the money. I would met Steve Ballmer, Gates retired account. And I was like, wow, that's really cool. But I still think it was a coincidence, right? And then my dad came to me and said, hey, your mom and I have been called to go serve in the temple presidency in Ghana, Africa. I think you should come out and get married in Africa. And I was like, that'd be awesome, but I don't even have a boyfriend and I have no time to date two kids, running a company, you know. Just put it on the poster. So I did. And less than a year later, I was in Ghana, Africa, getting married to an awesome guy from Idaho. Ladies, if you're dating a guy from Idaho, seal the deal. They're worth it, okay? So we got married, 12, it's, it'll be 12 years ago this Christmas, okay? When we got married, I sat down and made another gold poster. I was like, I wanna sell my company for a ton of money. I wanna start a foundation that helps encourage entrepreneurship for self-reliance. I want to angel invest in other entrepreneurs. I wanna see the seven wonders of the world. And I found a postcard and put it on there on the plane and that's self-explanatory, why everybody would want that, okay? So as the next couple years went by, I ended up going to four of the seven wonders, not because of the postcard, but life just took me there. I don't know why it happens, it just does. I sold my company for all that money. I started Reese Capital to angel invest in entrepreneurs. I started the IPOP Foundation, which is the charity that helps promote entrepreneurship as a pathway to self-reliance. I got my time and my life back with my son and my daughter and my husband, which was awesome. And my husband's like, okay, now what? What are you gonna do? And I was like, I wanna build a dream house. 
because I had sold my company. I was like, what else do you do, right? And so <laughs> I made a poster, and it was m many more than just these slides. But this is just a couple of slides off the goal poster for the house. Over the next 12 months, this is the actual house. It's the closet, ladies. Spiritual moment, I know. <laughs> if we had time, we'd have an official moment of silence, but we're out of time. But that goal poster, for her wedding, she got married a couple years, 138 page PowerPoint, no joke. That wedding was spectacular, <laughs> right? And so then I sat down to start the next poster, right? And this was just in the last couple years. I sat down, I was like, my husband was like, what are you gonna put on there? I'm like, I don't know, because it's kind of intimidating now. I put down, I wanna have a whole bunch of grandbabies. They each get a million dollars on their eighth child. There's no negotiating down from that. I want 16 grandkids, okay? I was like, I wanna go to Europe and go on vacation. I want to see my son and daughter get married in the temple because that's important in my faith. I wanted to finish my education because it drove me nuts that I didn't get it finished, but I was not going to go back to school and sit in the classroom. So I was like, I don't want to put it on the poster. My husband was like, put it on, you don't know. And I thought, well, I've written this blog now for all these years. I should publish a book. Over the next, it was less than four months later, I got a call telling me I was getting an honorary PhD. I was bawling when they called me. They probably thought I was the biggest weirdo. But to me, they didn't know about my poster. They had no idea what that meant to me. Feel free to call me doctor, by the way. Europe, the next year, we went to all those places in Europe and got to go as a family to visit those places. And both my son and my daughter got married in the temple in the last couple years. And I had two years ago my first little grandbaby boy, adorbs. And this year I had a little grandbaby girl a couple months ago. So, and then Forbes called and asked me if they could publish my book. And so here is the book. It just came out earlier this year. It's called What Awesome Looks Like. It's done like a mirror because it reflects you. You're what awesome looks like, how to excel in business and life. It's like an ADD guide to success. <laughs> There's no chapter more than three pages. It's all very quick. <laughs> the whole point is, as a young girl, I would have said, <laughs> it's edited people, it's BYU. So <laughs> I would have said, don't limit the picture in your head because my crayon drawing back as a kid would have been that. At your age, I would have been, and you are kids to me because I could be your brother, which is terrifying. So that up there is what I would have seen but what God intends your life to be is a masterpiece. So thank you for letting me come and talk to you guys today. This is my contact data. If I can ever help any of you, I am happy to do that. My blogs are at amyreefanderson.com. There's 10 years, you can search every topic under the world. The search thing is not on your cell phone, it will be soon, it's on their computer. But anyway, the point is, you guys are amazing and you're already so far ahead of the game from where I was. We have about two minutes for, oh no, we don't have, we're gonna go upstairs. I hope you guys can come upstairs and join me.